put on this computer. I'm on it. All right. And then did you also uh, share to your group or did you? I did not. Um, oh, man. See, can, what would can, you do? Can you share from your side to my group? Let me try. I'm trying to right now. Let's see. All right. But that's okay because I announced in my group that it would be on the SRT um, page. So All right. Fair enough. Yeah. It won't let me share it. So we'll just get, we'll just go. We can share it after the fact. Exactly. We'll share it afterwards. So um, you guys who are here live with us, feel free to, um, to add to the chat as we're going through this, if you have questions, but um, the big changes, let's talk about that. So the complaints we've been getting is people are saying that there has been lower organic sales and they've been seeing high ACOS. Andy and I both noticed. Um, when I got back from China, I was gone for 30 days, so basically I just like left my, my PPC alone. And um, during those uh, 30 days, these are campaigns that I've had spun up for like six months or longer. And keywords such as, um, such as you guys know I'm in the, in the cat litter category, keywords that aren't seasonal <laughs> um, and were not this expensive last year during high advertising season had tripled in price. And because of that tripling in price, suddenly my, um, suddenly my, um, my ACOS skyrocketed because, you know, the, the keyword price went up and obviously my ad placement then, because I'm bidding lower and I hadn't touched my, my advertising, um, my a cost went way up and my placement went down so then there's lower sales based on on that ppc so this is what is happening across the board now um why why is this kind of stuff happening so it's it's our theory here uh andy has been kind of collecting some data here from various groups from various people and from his own kind of things that are going on so the first thing is that amazon is downgrading organic results um, you know, they're number one, pushing their own private label products um, up. They're larger brands with featured ad sections. I don't know if you guys have noticed as you're searching through Amazon, you're seeing these, um, these really big headline search ads. And then there's some, some additional um, ad areas that have been added. Um, and then really um, the push to pay to play. So people have noticed that, um, that they're, uh, you know, there's, they're really lowered organic sales and they're really only making sales if they're paying for advertising. So that's really kind of um, thrown a lot of people off. The other thing I've noticed is that um, Amazon is now advertising, like I was, I've been watching commercials lately. Uh, we just subscribed to a TV service. We didn't used to do that. And um, Amazon's commercials used to feature third party brands. And now they feature Amazon's private label brands only. And I thought that that was really, really interesting. Um, also curated product selections. I don't know if you guys have noticed, but now there's like these big sections within the pages that say like editorial recommendations. Um, they're kind of adding these various sections to the website. And so sometimes your products can be featured and sometimes they can't be. In fact, I was on a client call this morning and we saw that that client's products were actually featured in the editorial recommendations as, um, as the budget, uh, budget friendly product. So that's awesome. But if yours is not featured, that could be, <laughs> that could be not awesome if you used to be on page one and now that has pushed you to page two or page three. So uh, organic results and Andy, do you have anything else to add to the organic results? Uh, so I just got booted. I think you probably noticed. Uh, and then I came back in, which was, which was fun. But, um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, so, um, uh, man, I, now I forgot what I was going to say. Of course, uh, that's what happens when you have three small children. Um, <laughs> Uh, I don't remember. Continue. It's okay. So then, you know, of course, Andy has uh, not only three small children, but he also lives in California where he has been affected by the wildfires and the power outages, not once, uh, <laughs> but <laughs> many, many times. Um, and, you know, it's a large state. So there, there could be some problems with these power outages and stuff where people are not necessarily shopping. Uh, and then, Number three, Google downgrading organic Amazon results. Um, Google has rolled out some big changes to their algorithm. 
Um, and so they may be not necessarily sending as much traffic to Amazon as they used to be. Andy, what have you noticed in this area? Yeah, so I've I've done some research. There's nothing conclusive, so I don't want to say this. That's why you know these are all kind of we we call them theories, um, because they're 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 nothing proven by scientific data. But um, you know these are just so, some of the things that I came up with when I started researching uh, and kind of looking into why I I thought that that uh, um, you know my sales and and sales of, of other sellers. Um, we did a poll in the in the um, Titan group, and uh, I think it was like majority. I want to say like. I can't remember the, I wish I'll, I'll pull it up here in a second, but um, it was, you know, majority of the people had said they had been affected by the, the change in October. Now, um, you know, that's non-scientific and a little bit misleading because October and November, you know, there's always PVC costs always do increase um, w with the season and things like that. But um, what we were seeing is, is not only the PVC costs going up, but the organic rank on Amazon going down. Um, and just, you know, sales in general. Now, a lot of those sales are probably being diverted to, you know, um, ad placements and Amazon's own products. But when you think about it, um, you know, if Amazon um, is losing traffic coming from Google. So in other words, when you, you search for something in Google, you know, instead of a, a link to an Amazon product coming up, say, you know, third or fourth on the list on Amazon, you know, if, if they penalize Amazon and push them that further down the list, now all of a sudden the Google shopping links will be more prevalent and, you know, some other links to other websites. Uh, one of the things that I just read uh, again more recently is that um, Google is starting to prioritize a lot more local searches. So, you know, if you say, for example, searching for a lawnmower, now instead of a uh, listing on Amazon coming up as one of the first links, you know, maybe it's a link to your local hardware store. Um, so that's uh, something that's also kind of out uh, that I've read. I think it was on uh, searchenginewatch.com that I read that recently. Um, oh, and there's something we can do about that. So let's, we will definitely cover that too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's all of the, you know, there's always a solution to a problem. So to me, yeah. um, you know, it's just like when they got that, got rid of, um, you know, uh, reviews, um, you know, a, you know, the whole like discount for review thing. A lot of people, um, could not figure that out. And, um, and so, uh, you know, it was one of those things where people didn't know what to do. Uh, to me, that was a blessing because then it started to be, you couldn't kind of cheat in order to get your products, uh, placed, you know, on Amazon. And I sort of feel like the pain here is going to be felt by all of us, but, um, I almost feel like um, it's going to be a blessing in the fact that uh, it's going to force everybody to start moving to different marketplaces, start pushing their own um, websites, start getting more creative. Um, you know, it's just like, you know, if you don't have enough money in the bank to, you know, run your business or whatever it is, you start getting creative. You know, the less money, Gary Vee always talks about this, is like the less you have to work with, the more creative you're going to be. So I think that, um, you know, if you start getting really creative with your Amazon business, that you can, you know, make lemonade out of the lemons. Exactly. So, and then this next one is this theory from Yev. And I don't really see this as so much a theory because um, this has kind of been a well-known fact for a long time that um, Amazon has multiple fulfillment centers. And so you notice when you send your products to Amazon, they, they go in reserve status for a little while and they get spread across all the fulfillment centers so that they can um, fulfill them prime shipping, right? Two day or even one day shipping. Um, so naturally, if you only send 10 units in, that's not enough to get them placed all the way across the country. And what can happen then is that um, if you don't, if you don't have units all across the country, they're not even going to show up in search results. So if somebody in California, for example, is searching for your product or your, your main keyword, and you only have uh, products in the fulfillment center in Florida, um, you're not even going to show up in those search results and that can affect your sales. So, um, you know, that's just one of the things that, that, make sure you're sending in enough stock so that your, your inventory can be, you know, properly distributed across all of the FCs. And then last, Amazon may be putting even more negative pressure on discounted products in terms of rank. Um, so if, and this also kind of plays with pricing. If you're playing around a ton with your pricing, if you're, if you're constantly um, changing your pricing around and constantly messing with things, um, the algorithm doesn't like that. <laughs> it sees it as kind of an untrusted thing. I know people who have been doing retail arbitrage, 
that have been um, using repricers and stuff, a lot of their listings get suppressed because they're constantly changing prices around. And I've seen some people posting about that in various groups. So just be really careful about your pricing and have a strategy behind it. Um, try not to just be all over the place and be constantly, um, you know, kind of thinking about that stuff. So um, I'm just kind of monitoring the chat here. And so Carol says, so send in three months worth of stock at a time. Uh, yeah, exactly. You should have, um, you know, how much for products that only sell one to two per day? Well, if your products only sell one to two per day, then you're going to want to make sure that, um, that number one, you set a goal to sell more. And we're going to talk about that. But number two, that um, you send in enough stock where it can be equally distributed because that could be affecting your sales. So it's kind of a catch-22. All right. So that is what's been happening, some of the theories that have been going on. So Amy, first, first world seller problems. <laughs> exactly. First world seller problems. So... What products have been most affected by this? So as I mentioned, some of my products have been affected. Some have not. Some of my clients' products have been affected. Some have not. So I'm going to talk about that. So the products that have been most effective, affected, excuse me, number one, those that are in extremely competitive niches. So if your main keyword is really competitive, guess what? Your keyword costs are going to go up because there's more advertisers. And oh, by the way, your chances of getting on page one or getting pushed down from page one are really high, uh, especially with all the new ads and stuff going on. So, and we'll talk about what you can do about that in just a minute. Um, and then number two, if your products are only on Amazon. So basically if you just launched on Amazon and the only thing you do is run Amazon PPC, you have no website, you have no external brand presence, you basically built your whole business around Amazon this is going to affect you because you, you, you're not taking advantage of any external buyers coming in and finding your product. So you're just relying on Amazon and that's really, it's tough to do. Um, and then number three, products highly reliant on PPC to sell. So if you have been really, if the only way you're making sales is via PPC, that tells us that you're in a very competitive niche and it's going to be very difficult for you to continue at these higher keyword costs to make money unless your margins are just absolutely incredible and you can continue throwing money at it. So those are the products that have been most affected. Andy, um, would you say that we're pretty spot on there? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, the reason being is that, um, you know, the, the competitive uh, categories, the com competitive products, um, that's where bigger brands are going to be in spending more money on PPC as well. So if you have kind of more of a niche product, um, you know, the, you're probably going to have less competition on the PPC front as well. And not only that, but, you know, Amazon's less likely to compete with you um, in terms of, you know, having their own private label product. You know, if you are, you know, selling, uh, you know, horse conditioner, <laughs> for example, you know, that's something pretty niche. Now you might be making a ton of money in a horse conditioner because you're the only one who's natural and, uh, you know, you've got some crazy things going on. So you're, you know, you're selling enough of those to make a, a great living. Those are actually, I would say probably um, in the, the way the atmosphere is on Amazon now, probably the better products to be in is the yeah. more niche products because your chances of Amazon competing with you is going to be a lot lower. Now, if you go into the ultra competitive stuff, you know, that's when you're going to have to start looking out because Amazon will go, Oh, look, Amy's got this uh, water bottle that's selling tons and tons. And, we can find out who's her supplier is because we're Amazon and we have, you know, all the data in the world. We can go to them. We can add a little feature. We can undercut her by $2 and we can show up on the search results before her. So guess what? <laughs> yep. We can put her out of business. Yep, um, exactly. You know, I don't, I don't want to know. I don't want to say that Amazon is being that devious, but it's hard to not think that. Well, um, they're a business the, too, right? So if yep, they see something they is selling really well, if they say something's selling really well, of course they're going to private label it. Walmart does the same thing. Target does the same thing. You know, those main stays, if you will, those products that customers buy a lot of, you want to have your own private label brand of it. Any of us who had our own store would do the same thing, right? Um, you know, you definitely, and you, I remember when I used to do um, wholesale on Amazon, uh, I would always consider private, private labeling those little things that sold really well. Like why not do my own brand of those things, right? 
So it just, it makes sense. You can't really blame them. You would do it yourself, you know? And so that's, that's the, um, the big thing there is also not competing with Amazon. So what products have not been affected? Um, number one, sub niches like horse shampoo. <laughs> there's less, there's less, they're less competitive. There's more room for organic ranking. Um, non Amazon competitors. So if Amazon has not private labeled it, like we just talked about with the, the horse shampoo, now everybody's going to go sell horse shampoo. Right. Um, but, <laughs> but if, if Amazon is not competing with you, you're going to have a much better chance because what's happening is they're pushing their own private labels up. So, uh, you know, the, I, the commercial that I saw the other day, they had a serving tray and they had a, a throw blanket. Well, guess what? If you're in any of those categories, good luck. They're at the top of the page and they intend to remain there. Um, products with a strong external brand presence. So even if you're, very comp you're in a very competitive niche, but your brand is well known and you've already connected with your customers externally, they don't really care. They're searching for your brand name. So it doesn't matter if, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't matter if there's a ton of competitors because they're going to buy from you. You've already gained their trust. They already love you. So it does, that's what you can do in the competitive area is you can build a stronger external brand presence so that people are coming to Amazon specifically to buy from you. And we'll talk about how to do that. Products with high organic sales meeting a unique demand. So my products um, have been largely unaffected. Andy asked me while I was in China, I was like, oh, my, my units are still good. They're, my numbers are good. You know, my phone goes to Ching every couple of minutes. Um, so it's because I'm meeting a unique demand. I have a unique product. So people are searching for the problem that my product solves. And I'm not having, I don't, I don't even barely advertise on Amazon. Um, so that's, that's the thing is, you know, if you're, if you're, uh, if you can identify a unique demand that your product meets that your competitors are not uh, identifying, uh, you're going to do well. If you can move to a sub niche um, with your current, let's say your product is really, really competitive, right? And um, you can identify um, a sub niche to move into. Like maybe you identify a, a problem that your product solves or a really unique um, differentiator of your pro product that your competitors are not calling out. Well, then you could be featured in a sub niche um, spe you know, specifically for that product by just kind of rewriting your listing a little bit. Um, so that is, that's kind of the way to, to deal with that. So how to take control of your destiny, how to do this. You want to become the unaffected product. If you're currently affected, how do you move it over into the unaffected category? Number one, you can sell in sub niches, right? So if we're selling that water bottle and we're incredibly competitive and Amazon's selling against us and their stuff, you know, we're, we're, we're on like page 50 because we can't get up there. Well, what is it about your water bottle? Could it be remarketed to bikers? Could it be remarketed to somebody in a specific sub niche? Maybe you have the ultimate runner's water bottle. You know, often when I get on calls, I have people sell me their product, like, tell me about it. What's great about it? And 99% of the time, a lot of the stuff that's really great about it, that they identify how unique it is, is not in their listing. So really, you guys, if you can break down your products and understand the uniques of your product, even if you're very competitive, you can move into a sub niche. Get out there on Amazon, start studying those subcategories and find the best subcategory for you and rebrand your product to be sold in that sub niche. All you do is update your listing. You do the right keywords. You open up a, a case with Amazon and you get your product moved to one of those subcategories. Uh, and that's really going to help you make more sales because you could become a bestseller in a subcategory. Um, and, and you're not going to be, we talked about this during our last podcast, talking about listing optimization, right? You don't want to aim for that top search term. You want to aim for the one with the most buyer intent. So if you've got a water bottle, you got to sell it to a niche. 
Um, all right, so next, if you're selling against an Amazon private label or you're in an extremely competitive niche, connect with and sell your customers off of Amazon. So remember when we said the people who are off of Amazon are unaffected? You guys are addressing such a tiny part of your total addressable market. It's so small on Amazon compared to all of retail and compared to the, your total addressable market. So start thinking about marketing outside of Amazon. It's okay to keep selling on Amazon. I'm not telling you to get off of Amazon. I'm telling you to get to marketing, get to reaching and connecting with customers because then they're going to be searching for your brand. They're going to be searching for your product. Um, so really, you know, definitely have them have, find, come up with a way to do that. We're going to talk about that. I'm going to tell you exactly how to do this. Um, Build a strong external brand presence. I know so many people tell me, Amy, I don't know what that means. I don't know how to get started. I have a Facebook page, but what the heck do I do with it? I have a Pinterest, but I don't, I've never pinned anything. I don't, I don't know where to get started with YouTube pre-roll ads. Guys, just like you had to learn Amazon, you've got to learn your market and you've got to learn where your market hangs out and then do the research and chip away at it a little bit at a time. If you don't know how to do YouTube pre-roll ads and you think that those would be the most, um, you know, effective for your product, well, get out there and do some research on that. Um, I did some research on it for TCFE and I learned that, oh my gosh, I can do that right from my Google ads dashboard. And oh, wow, I can actually identify specific videos. I want my pre-roll ads to show up in. Awesome. It's not so tough, right? So really, you know, start building your external brand presence and don't be afraid to do that. Um, and then work on your organic sales. Identify your uniques and capitalize on them. So again, even if you're in a very competitive category, there is something special about your product or there's something about your product that your competitors are not calling out that you can identify. Anything more on this, Andy? Yeah, one quick thing. I don't know if you mentioned it uh, further on in the slides, but one of the biggest uh, things that people should be doing now, especially now, um, if you have not started yet, is to build an email list. You know, everybody's all fixated with ManyChat and things like that. And, you know, building a chatbot list is not a bad thing either. But the problem with that and any other platform, um, even the ones you mentioned, Amy, is that you don't own it. So, you know, if you have a giant ManyChat list, Facebook can and will, I guarantee you, start saying like, oh, if you want to send this many chat, um, you know, thing to this person, it's going to cost you 10 cents or, you know, you're going to have to bid in order to get that person's attention. That's coming. I guarantee you, it's just a matter of time. This is Facebook's MO. They roll something out for free. Everybody adopts it. And then they turn the switch to start charging for it. Um, and he's saying they're already doing that. So, um, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's something that's, you know, you need to think about with an email, um, yeah, the open rates aren't as good. The click through rates aren't as good, but you own that list. That is your list. Um, so, you know, once you build that list, um, you know, then you can go back to it and market to that list. You can send out newsletters. You can, you know, whenever you have a blog post or whenever you have a new product or anything, you have that list now to go to. The other thing that I really like that is super underutilized is especially if you have um, a, uh, WordPress website, but it works on anything. Uh, some websites you might need to custom code it is those little pop-ups that say, Hey, do you want to get notified by our website of a new post or a new thing that, you know, there's a bunch of plugins out there that'll do it. But what that does is when somebody comes to their site and say, yeah, you know, I want to hear about when you post a new blog post or whatever, you can automate this. So whenever you post a new blog post, you know, that little flag in Chrome will come up and say, Hey, you know, seller SEO just posted a new blog post. Do you want to go read about it? Uh, and they click on it and come to your site. Now, all of a sudden you got those eyeballs back. So it's all those, you know, little nuances, you know, Amy and I are both super into um, Zapier or Zapier, however you want to call it. I always call it Zapier, but um, tomato, tomato, um, you know, automate as much of that stuff as you can. Um, you know, that's stuff I'm still working on because with those tools, you can automate so many things, you know, um, like, like right now, if we post, if I post a, a new blog uh, episode or a, a new podcast episode, it gets posted to all my social channels automatically without like having to do anything. It's just, Oh, there's a new post. Okay then do this, do that, do this, do this, do this, do this, do that. Um, you know, and those are the kind of automations. Those are the kind of things that you guys can do that other people aren't doing that are really going to help you win uh, moving forward. Yeah. I was on a call this morning and we were talking about that. Um, somebody's sales had gone down and they were saying that they just started kind of advertising to their website more. 
and taking le more external advertising away from Amazon. And they thought that that might have affected their sales. And I explained, well, yeah, people trust Amazon more as a buying platform to buy products. So that's good to keep those ads going to Amazon for the buying portion of it but still do some organic and some ads to your website for the freebies and the awesome content, because then you still have those people to market to. So if you're selling, you know, something that's in a, a very cool niche, we'll provide some value, give a, create a community for people. Like maybe you're selling a product for runners, create a community for runners, join our runners community. You know, and that's, that's exciting for people. People want to do that. People want to connect over things. So, you know, send them to your website for that. And then you have them. And then when it comes time to, you've got their trust and, and you've provided some value. And then when it comes time to sell to them, say, hey, we're offering 20% off only for our subscribers. And here it is. And it's, you know, then you're sending them back to Amazon. So no problem there. And you're still increasing your external traffic but you're utilizing um, your marketing both ways to where they trust to buy from Amazon, but then they trust your website to connect with you and get extra value. Yeah, Amy, that's a great point. That's a good technique. And we, we do this is where <clears throat> if you land on our website on one of our pages, we have two buttons. We say buy direct or buy an Amazon or buy direct price is usually a couple bucks cheaper than buy an Amazon. But when we have the person click on buy an Amazon, we say, cool, we'll give you the 20% off, enter your email address and we'll send you the code. That way you're still getting that customer. That's still your customer. Now you're not sending them to Amazon and never hearing from them again. You're now keeping your customer and sending them, them onto Amazon. So you're still getting that, uh, that customer's data and you're still getting the trust of Amazon. So you're kind of getting the best of both worlds. Now, another kind of, uh, ninja trick that you can do with that is combine that with, um, with Amazon, um, affiliates, so, you know, if somebody clicks through from your website, goes to Amazon, they buy your product and then add three more things to the cart, you're going to get the commission on those three things that they add to the cart. So that's another little trick that you guys can do to offset those ad costs to send them directly to your website. So that's and just, cool. just be careful though of pricing your product lower on your website than you do on Amazon simply because if you're using an insert that drives them to your website, um, that is actually against TOS. And, um, so that could actually be a reason for suspension. So just be really, if you're selling on your website, make sure your prices are equal. If you are sending them to, to Amazon from your insert. Um, and, and also a caveat to that as well is um, what I was just about to say with the affiliate stuff is you cannot combine coupons with affiliate codes. So if you send somebody from your website, uh, you know, with an affiliate link to Amazon, it cannot be combined with a discount. Yeah. Cool. So I, I, the biggest problem that I get with clients when I'm working with them on building uh, business planning and building out their business and building out their brand messaging is they just, they don't know how to do market research. And so that's what we're going to go over because you guys are probably, some of you might be wondering, well, okay, I got all this stuff, guys, but how the heck do I decide what channels to market on? How do I get started? How do I do all that? So that's what I've put together for you, and that's what we're gonna work through. And just so you guys know, I'm gonna give you a link at the end of this that allows you to download. There's a template from SCORE um, that allows you to download kind of all the information that I'm going over, and that's really going to help you kind of fill in the blanks after this presentation that will help you um, get even better at marketing and identifying your uniques. So start with your market research. How do you do market research? You have primary market research. This is information that you gather yourself. So this is just like, all right, I'm going online. I'm going to go check. I'm going to search for, uh, you know, water bottles for runners. And I'm going to see what local stores have these. I'm going to see what um, competitors are selling. I'm going to, you know, and also driving around town, go into your Walmart, see what, what's on the shelf, you know, local little mom and pop stores. No matter where you are, uh, whether you're in Australia or Europe or whatever, you can do this. You can identify competitors, what they're doing. 
You can interview or survey people who fit the profile of your target customers. So many people don't do this, right? Like go in a Facebook group, you're selling something for runners, as we said, go in. In fact, I have a client who's selling something for runners. She kind of created something for runners. And I set her up with, uh, my sister has a running group and she's like crazy about, they're, they're crazy. They like get together all the time and they do all this crazy running stuff. I don't, we do that in CrossFit too, right? So, um, but she involved them early on in her product development process. So now they feel like part of the, the team, right? And they're happy to promote her product for her. But go out there and interview and talk to people, you know, and just say, hey, you know, what do you think about this? And, um, and, and really get an idea of who your market is and what people are saying, for, saying about your product. And you won't believe people will actually identify new things about your product that you hadn't thought of. You know, they'll identify those things and say, oh, I would use that for this. That would be great for this. And now you've got another sub niche you can sell in. So don't be afraid to get out there and ask questions. Um, and you know, doing traffic counts at a retail location you're considering. So this really guys, if you go to, if you go to Walmart, for example, they, they have these little scanners that top that, um, show the sales across multiple stores. So you can actually do like the same research that you do on Amazon just by talking to people, talk to the manager in a department, go to your local mom and pop store and be like, Hey, you know, what are your customers looking for in terms of this? They'll be happy to talk to you about it. You know, it doesn't mean that you're necessarily selling them your product, but just talk to them about it. There's nothing wrong with that. All right, so you get your primary market research done, you get a good handle on it, then you start secondary market research. So this is where you get a lot of information from sources. When was the last time you looked, if you're in the pet niche, when was the last time you looked in a, in a journal or trade organization? Uh, have you gone to like the, the Global Pet Expo website and seen what featured products there are? Have you looked on any magazines that are in your niche? Have you looked at newspapers? Have you looked at advertisements? Look at census, census data. If you know that your target customer is ages 14 to 24, uh, well, how many of those are in the United States? Guess what? Google will tell you. Google will tell you the census data. So now you know what your total addressable market is. You know how to target your advertising. Look at the demographic profiles. If you're selling a hair care product that is mostly for people with curly or you know primarily like African American hair, well how many of those are there? And how much are you currently selling and are you really targeting that demographic? What does that demographic have to say? So you really need to get out there and understand your total addressable market. And when you start understanding your total addressable market, you're going to be like, wow, I'm barely scraping the surface. Nobody knows about me. And I have so much opportunity for more people to find out about me. Uh, how can you do this, this, uh, secondary market research? You can go online. You can go to libraries. My local San Antonio public library has trade journals. They have all these things. Like they'll pull a list of local retailers that are in my niche with addresses and everything. Um, chambers of commerce, vendors. Uh, you can, there's so many, you know, just looking at those, looking at the distributor. You can go, like I went to my local grocery store and I was looking in the pet area and, um, I noticed that all these products were distributed by the same distributor. I can give that distributor a call. Maybe they'd be happy to take on my product. You know, make that distributor your primary, primary client. Government agencies, that's another really great one, right? Maybe you're selling a product that you could be selling to government agencies. Do you know how much money the government spends on products? <laughs> Not to mention your small business association. All that kind of information can be gleaned from all of these resources. So get out there and start to understand your market and you're gonna see opportunity there that you hadn't seen before when you were only focused on Amazon. Next, identify the total size of your industry. How big is your industry? What are the trends in your industry? What is the total size of your target market? Is it realistic for you to obtain a share? I know for me, there's 51 million people in the United States that have cats. That's pretty important for me to know, right? 51 million people that have cats. 
Is there a share that's realistic for me to obtain? Heck yeah. Am I obtaining all of that share just on Amazon? Nope, I gotta get to work. So what are the trends in my target market? Is it growing or shrinking? What are customer needs or preferences? When I was doing this research, I learned that most people buy uh, litter box accessories online. I didn't know that. Do you know people spend more on litter box accessories than they spend on litter? Wow, that tells me there's a problem in my market and I've addressed it. But had I not done this market research, I would not have known that. So get out there and just start Googling this stuff. Just start answering these questions and you guys are gonna get this whole idea of, well, if most people buy it online, should I be tar targeting retailers? Maybe, maybe not, right? There's, there's a lot of information for me to understand and there's a lot of information for you to understand. All right, so then you start your marketing plan. You wanna identify your products, features, and benefits. And I know what you guys are thinking. You're like, Amy, we've already done this. It's on Amazon. But have you done the market research first and then identified the features and benefits of your product according to your market? Sometimes you haven't because you haven't gone out there and talked to people about it. You haven't gone out there and discovered additional um, markets that your product could potentially be featured in, trade magazines, all that kind of stuff. Think about that, get after it. So really get after your product's most important features. What's special about it? What are the most important benefits? What does it do for the customer? It's the funniest thing to me is when I go visit factories in China that make cat products, <laughs> they, they, none of them have cats as pets. So they don't understand, um, you know, I, ha I visited a factory, I was looking at some cat bedding and um, they, they tried to sell me a cooling material on a cat bed. And I was like, um, cats hate cooling material. They love to sit on warm surfaces. Even if it's 80 degrees in the house, they still go for the warmest surface. So often the factory doesn't even understand because they don't, they don't have pets, right? So it's important for you to understand it. Had I bought this cooling pet bed, I would have had a tough time selling it to cat people. <laughs> so, you know, explain your after sale services you plan to provide. So how do you want to deliver your product? Is there delivery beyond Amazon? How would you set that up? What would that look like? What about to distributors? You know, is there anything else you can do there? Do you wanna have a warranty or a guarantee? I can't tell you, I ask this question every time I write a listing and people don't know. They're like, oh, I don't know, should I have one? Well, you should be thinking through this because as Andy's little hack that he showed you, uh, warranties can be really, really appealing to people. They like companies that back up their stuff. You can get them to your website by just offering a warranty, but you gotta write that out ahead of time. You gotta figure that out. You can drive more traffic that way. You can gain more trust um, from your customers. Service contracts. Maybe you sell an electronics product that, that needs that service contract. You know, you could maybe pair up. Uh, I was at Global Sources and um, I met a guy, Brandon Dumsky, I believe, Dembski, that talked about how he literally takes people's returns of electronics and he's got all of these partnerships with um, like service providers and they basically fix them up and resell them and it's a huge market, right? So um, there's, there's all kinds of things you can do. Can you take your used products and fix them up and resell them? Amazon does this, right? So think about that. There's multiple channels that you can do that on. A used product sell very well on Amazon. Refurbished products sell very well on Amazon and eBay. Um, ongoing support, what kind of follow-up support do you wanna have? Is there any training required for your products? What is your refund policy? These are the kind of templates and stuff that you want to come up with so that your business can run efficiently and you can reach more customers and you can really understand your market and understand your product. Anything to add here, Andy? Nope, uh, I don't think so. You got it covered. All right. So then you've got to identify your target customer. So we talked about this now, and now you've gone through and you've looked at the trade publications, you're getting ideas, you're, you're like starting to understand your market. And suddenly you start to understand how old your target customer is, whether they're female, male, both, where they're located. You can go on Google Trends, trends.google.com. 
and you can search for your main keyword and you'll see primary locations. And you just talked about how Google is now promoting local searches. Guess what? You can now identify your website and then target to those local customers in New York, right? Uh, if, if your main person, main uh, market is in New York and it was funny, I was doing this with a client the other day and, and their main market was New York. And I was like, oh man, it'd be awesome to do some local targeting on Facebook or on Google specifically to New York because it's going to show up higher in search results than trying to advertise worldwide. And some of these search engines that, um, that go off of these local searches are going to prioritize your ads. So how great is that? And not to mention, if people in New York are looking for your product, how likely do you think they are to buy versus trying to advertise to everyone on Amazon? So really think about where are they located? What is their income level? If their income level is low, that's gonna affect your price point, right? Maybe you wanna be the great value version of your product. If their income level is high, well then you need to step up your game. You need to make sure everything about your product is premium and that people who are willing to reach into their pockets to spend a little bit more money on something are going to be appealed to your branding and your, uh, and your products. Their occupation, what kind of things do they do? Hey, if you figure out their occupations, if they're police, if they're firemen, if they're military, if they're lawyers, if they're doctors, do you think you might find some additional targeting opportunities? Heck yeah. <laughs> you know, you're going to have some awesome targeting opportunities. Now, suddenly, if doctors are the ones you want to target, what are the opportunities there? Where could you could set up, uh, you could set up YouTube pre-roll ads specifically on videos that doctors might be interested in. You could set up, um, you know, Facebook targeting for specific um, groups or pages, you can target specific pages that doctors tend to like, that your market tends to like. Before you know it, you're getting a lot more clicks, you're getting a lot more buys, um, and because it's more relevant to your audience and you're gaining their trust and they're going, oh yeah, they know what I like, right? Versus just trying to market to everyone. Then their education level. So their education level also, you know, that goes into your, mar your brand messaging and your marketing messaging. So what level does your copy need to be at? You know, is it going to be appealing to them if they're, if they're middle class and, um, and have more of, if, if they're middle class in mechanics, <laughs> well, you probably want to have some fun language in there, maybe some more comedy to your copywriting and your, and your brand messaging. But just make sure that you know, you are really speaking to your customer and you know who your customer is. So identify your competitors. So really now I totally messed up this slide. You guys, this still has the information from the, the, the previous slide on it. Um, but your key competitors, who are your competitors? Who are they? And hang on, I know that I have a slide. There we go. Key competitors. <laughs> I had an extra one in there. So understand how to differentiate your business and your products. So list the key companies that compete with you, their names, their locations. I cannot tell you how many times somebody has come to me and said, Amy, my top competitor, the top competitor for this keyword, which is not your top competitor, by the way, the top competitor for this keyword is selling like crazy. How can I be like them? And I go, have you Googled them? Have you looked at what they're doing? Are they on Pinterest? Are they, do they have YouTube videos? What does their web presence look like? Are they in any retail stores? You gotta stalk your competitors. You gotta figure out where they're connecting with their customers. Are they doing press releases? What is it? Are they featured in top 10 lists? That's why they're selling like crazy. You can't just expect to go on Amazon and sell like them if you don't do something like what they're doing to match them. So identify them and stalk them. And then when you identify your differentiation, you're going to be able to target the same niche, but really target those customers who are looking for your differentiation versus theirs. So learn from them, but differentiate. Um, also include your indirect competitors. For example, cat litter is still an indirect competitor to a litter box, right? Understand how many competitors are in your niche. Understand reasonable alternatives to your product. 
Um, this is something a lot of people don't do. They don't look at reasonable alternatives. So if I am selling a coffee mug that is super high tech and you know heats itself and brews its own coffee and all that other fun stuff, well, I can't expect to sell that to the total addressable market of people who would buy coffee mugs because guess what? I can buy this ceramic guy for 99 cents from the dollar store. That's a reasonable alternative, right? So you can't, you really need to identify the kind of person that's going to buy this high tech coffee mug, the kind of niche, who are they? How much money do they make? Where do they work? And how do you target them? All of this needs to get written down. All of this needs to go into your plan and your strategy. And then just start after just one channel, even if you start after one channel and you start creating your content based on that, you're going to succeed. You're going to be better. You've just got to start somewhere. Real quick, Amy, something uh, you guys want to do too, um, in terms of competitors, a lot of people don't do this uh, because they're, I don't know if they're afraid to or they're unaware. Now you can't compete, you're not supposed to target competitors' um, brand names in your listing. So in your listing, you're not supposed to uh, target competitors. A lot of people don't realize you can absolutely 100% target your competitors in PPC and you should be doing that because if you have a direct competitor that is selling a product very similar to yours, chances are they're going to see yours as an alternative, especially if it's ranked better or lower priced. Um, we have a campaign spun up in, um, in, uh, in our PPC that is, uh, you know, the, the, uh, our, like our main top 10 competitors brand names, and then also products that they sell that we sell. Um, and we've seen some really Uh oh. I think we lost Andy again. <laughs> so hopefully we're still live. It looks like we're still live. Um, and hopefully you guys can still hear me. Throw something in the chat if you can still hear me. But as Andy was saying, you can target your competitors. Make sure you're doing product targeting campaigns. Uh, this morning I was on a call and I found that this um, client had multiple times they had um, items frequently bought together or customers who bought this item also viewed the following. And then we checked on those listings and their product was not, um, their product was not advertising there. So all you have to do guys is spin up a product targeting campaign and put those ASINs of those competitors frequently bought together or indirect competitors. You know, if you're selling a water bottle for bikers, well, maybe the people who buy bike helmets would also buy a water bottle, you know? So you can definitely do that. Uh, Lisa's asking, can we use competitor brand names in PPC? Yes, absolutely, Lisa. You can even rank for competitor brand names it, because of PPC. That is not against TOS. You can do that all day long. You can set up a keyword that says, uh, if you're selling kitchen products, OXO is a pop popular brand in kitchen, all right? You can target OXO uh, garlic press, right? You can totally do that. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, Lisa, what you're thinking of is in the listing in the uh, in the listing in the back end. You're not supposed to put competitors. Well, at least in the back end, you can actually put competitors. I talked about this on our last podcast. You can actually put um, competitors uh, brand names in your listing if it's in a comparative um, way. Now you could get in trouble with the way that Amazon's working these days. Um, in terms of uh, being flagged for having a, comp uh, a trademark. Uh, but, you know, you guys have all seen, depending on your age, <laughs> you used to, they used to have the Coke versus Pepsi commercial. You know, Pepsi used to have the Pepsi challenge. And they mentioned Coke all day, Coke all day long in that commercial. You can do it if it's in a comparison uh, way. So if you were selling a water bottle, and uh, Contigo is one of my favorite brands of water bottles. If you're selling a competitor, you can say, hey, we... Uh, exceed, uh, you know, the, the cooling uh, capacity of Contigo water bottles. You can use it in a comparative way. Now, I'm not a lawyer. If you have a lawyer, you know, follow up with them. So I'm not going to tell you absolutely you can do this. But in my research, from what I've seen, um, it's absolutely, um, you know, you can do it. Like I said, that's not saying that you won't get in trouble with the trademark hawks that are all over Amazon these days. Yep. Exactly. You want to do your due diligence, definitely. Um, and that goes in all areas of business. So 
Then you want to conduct a competitive analysis. So this is an example of the competitive analysis. There's more areas to this, but you want to look at your products versus all of your competitors. And look at this over here on the right, guys, the importance to the customer. You've got to validate the importance to the customer. So if yours is green and your competitors are red and black and you're like, I'm the only one with green. Well, really, what, what is the importance to the customer? for green, right? Andy, you have like a weird arrow that's going all over the screen. It's like says Andy in an arrow. I'm, I'm trying to say importance to the customer. Oh, okay. I like it. I like it. He's pointing <laughs> it out, you guys. He's pointing it out. So go down the line and compare. How does your product's price compare? I can't tell you. So many people use product research software and they're like, you know, yeah, these are the top competitors. Dude, look on page one. <laughs> Just look on page one. That's all you need. You don't need, you don't need a product research software. You literally just have to look on page one for your main, uh, main keyword. Look at the ranks and look at the prices. That's all you need to do. And then look at your main competitors, right? And what prices are they selling at? Is there, are there's a, re if, if there's a reasonable alternative to yours, um, then what is the importance to the customer for price? Quality, selection, service, reliability, stability, expertise, all of that. You got you to gotta break it all down because what is this going to help you do? It's going to help you market better. It's going to help you write better copy. It's going to help you identify uh, more features and benefits of your product versus your competitors. As Andy just mentioned, we beat Contigo on these things, right? Well, if you don't do the competitive analysis, you might not know that. So take the time to do that. Your positioning. So you've assessed it all now, you guys. We've gone through this. We've done it. We understand our customers, our competition, our product. We have a clear understanding of our niche, our unique segment of the market, as well as our position, how we want to present our company to customers. So now we come up with our actual marketing plan, our advertising plan. So Think of all the places you can advertise, you guys. Online, in print, in magazines, in newspapers, um, on the radio, uh, iHeartRadio, Pandora. There's so many options out there. Figure out where your customer hangs out and start advertising there. If you're not sure how to advertise there, do some research. Just start one channel at a time. That's all you have to do. Cable television, out of home. Which media were you advertised in? Why and how often? Identify these things and just start researching them and start on one channel and keep expanding. And, uh, and you, before you know it, you're gonna understand what works, what doesn't work. You're gonna be able to apply more money to the things that work really well. And you're really gonna reach more customers and you're gonna sell more on Amazon. It's really amazing how it works. All right, marketing channels. Here's some more marketing channels. Your website, social media, email, mobile, search engine optimization, content marketing, print marketing materials, brochures, flyers, business cards. You know, having those things, print marketing materials. Every time you go out and, you know, you're talking to people about your product, um, you're, you're talking to, to um, retailers about your product, you, you should have these things on hand because people, you know, they forget, they want to know like, oh, well, how can I find it? Um, luckily, you know, if your product's on Amazon, you can be like, oh, let's, let's search for it on Amazon right now. Um, I do that a lot with people when I'm telling them, telling them about my product. I'm like, oh yeah, let's look, I'll show it to you on Amazon. All right. Uh, public relations, trade shows, networking, word of mouth, referrals, all of these things are possible and so much more. So just start identifying some of these channels and start getting after it. All right, now your brand image. So you've got all of this information. Now you really need to identify your brand image. You need to talk about what problem or need, what problem are you solving or what need are you meeting? You don't always have to invent a new product. Sometimes your product will solve a problem for a certain niche that your other competitors aren't aware of or aren't calling out. So you can definitely do that. Don't feel like it's impossible. It's definitely possible. And we've given multiple examples of it. Um, and then what design elements are you going to use to market your business? Your logo, your signage, 
you know, your interior design that's more for like storefronts, but um, explain how these are gonna support your brand. All of this goes into your marketing plan, you know, and, and really it's going to help you in your marketing across the internet. The worst thing that you can do is pay a bunch of money for ads that don't convert. And the reason that ads don't convert is, and people, trust me, these ad agencies are happy to take your money. They're happy to take your money and set up ads that are not going to convert. You have to identify your customers. So think about it. If you scroll through your Facebook feed, what product advertisements make you stop and look? Which ones do you scroll right by without even realizing it? And which ones make you stop and look? And why do they make you stop and look? I know for me, the ones that actually show a product in use and, you know, like kind of catch my eye. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. What is that? And then I stop and I watch, you know. Uh, and then if there's a, a, an offer, an irresistible offer, then I feel like, oh, man, I might, I might have fear of missing out if I, don't, if I don't take advantage of this offer right now, right? So just really get after it, you guys. Don't be afraid to study your competitors, study how they're advertising, identify your differentiation, and then you guys get after your advertising on top of that. So, you know, I'm going to make a plug for Inspire 2020. If this is something that is really tough for you, if marketing and branding and brand messaging and planning and growth and goals and milestones are really tough for you, go to amazingathome.com slash inspire and get signed up for our conference. We're going to do it the last week in January, my birthday uh, of 2020. And we are focusing on just this, on helping you define all of these things and break through these barriers that you just cannot seem to get through. There are experts and we have tons of people flying in. I've got some local experts that are also coming to speak that taught me sales, um, taught me marketing and advertising. And I'm just so excited to do this. So get out there. And also for you folks that are overseas, we will offer an option. We're working on offering an option for the videos to be purchased, but definitely, um, you know, being there in person and working through it, we're going to do some breakout groups. It's going to be awesome. So if this is something that you really need help with to scale your business, get out there and fill out the interest form um, on amazingathome.com slash inspire so that we know that you're interested and we can provide you updated information. So this is it. This business plan template that I use to create these slides is at score.org resource business plan template startup business. So now let's open it up for a few minutes for questions. And then we're going to, um, to wrap it up. I really appreciate you guys listening to all this. Remember, there are things that you can control. Let's be the product that is unaffected. And there's lots of ways you can do that. And hopefully this was super helpful to you. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing. And is there any questions um, by anyone? Oh, look at that. Megan posted the Inspire 2020 conference interest form. Great. Nice work. <laughs> hey, Carol says podcast targeting your niche. Yes. Those are like, there's a lot of cheaper forms of advertising. I'm going to start advertising on Candy Crush. They always have good ads. <laughs> Actually, mobile ads are um, really cheap, but they generally don't convert well. Unfortunately, the thing with yeah, mobile ads wanna, is you don't want to leave your game, right? <laughs> well, yes, but it's also tons of like kids who have no money. So restrict the age. <laughs> That's kind of a secret tip for mobile advertising is like, you know, filter anybody below like the age of 25. <laughs> Love it. Love it. That's awesome. Yeah. And then also there's ads on... Um, there's ads on like Hulu. Hulu has been running some crazy ads. Um, Reddit, just, your Reddit's got some, oh, uh, got an I ad love. platform, which is super under, underutilized and you can go really niche on that because they have subreddits. Yes. Um, yeah. There's, there's a lot of creative uh, advertising platforms. Pinterest, a lot of people don't know you can advertise on Pinterest now. Yes, you can. It's, it's, it's about though, it's about having that targeted ad that people are actually going to look at and go, Ooh, that's my niche. 
Ooh, yep. that's me. That product's yep. just for me. And so that's why I want you to take the time to do your marketing plan and stuff because you're really going to um, be able to write copy and ads that your, your niche is going to go, oh, I need that. I need that right now. Oh, wait, let me click on that. So that's, that's what we really want you guys to do. And there's nothing wrong with running those ads to Amazon. And, and guys, go on YouTube and search for Facebook retargeting and AdWords retargeting. Those are two other, so many people don't retarget and the, those are going to perform better than any other ad. So if you guys yes. want to have the best performance without spending the most money, make sure you got those conversion pixels set up. Make sure you're retargeting, um, you know, going after those warm audiences. If you don't know what a warm audience is, <laughs> that's another YouTube search. These are all things that you guys need to start doing. Yep. Um, with YouTube out there, you know, these days there's no excuse. Like I tell my son, I'm like, don't worry, son. I don't need to pay for college. You're just going to learn everything you need to know on YouTube. And it's unfortunately or fortunately, it's true. Yeah, there is so much great information out there. But the more that you know your market and your niche, the more you're going to be able to filter through that information. Um, that's, really? you know, one of the biggest things that people complain about is, wow, there's so much. I was on a, a, one of the client calls I was on this morning, talked about that. Like, Amy, there's so much information. I don't know which course to go with. I don't know. Well, if you know your niche, you don't need any of that because you are going to know what information to search for. You're going to be able to fill in the blanks on your business and your marketing plan. And that is where you then identify those videos of, oh, you know, how do I retarget on Shopify? Let me search for that on YouTube instead of how do I do everything? I don't understand anything, right? So you guys just get after that. We believe in you. We know you've got this under the wraps, right? You've got this under wraps and, um, and get out there and kill it. Get out there and control the things that you can control and let's not worry about it. Let's worry about Amazon being a sales channel, but let's control the traffic that goes to that sales channel and sell the heck out of our products. Get her done. Get her done. Uh, and then Shay asked, can you apply all of this to other products other than private label or is this all for private label? Well, Shay, if you have a storefront where you're selling a bunch of things, can you have a website where you target a specific niche? Yup. Can you target a specific niche? Uh, let's say you're selling automotive products. Can you target a specific niche on your website and on ads? Yup. <laughs> can you set up an automotive club and sell to them? Yup. You can do all of these things, write your business plan, understand your niche, write your plan on how to market to that niche. And it's okay. You don't have to have private label products. You just have to understand your business and then understand the targeting of your niche and you can rock it. All right, guys. Well, we're off here. I'm going to go cook dinner. Um, I'm coaching tonight, so I coach on Tuesday night, so I'm going to get off of here, but it's been so good just reconnecting with you guys. And, um, next week on seller Roundtable, we are going to have all of the people that came with us on our China trip. And we're just going to talk about all the things that we learned and how cool it was and fun. So, uh, you guys tune in for that. And we have lots of great, I met so many awesome uh, people out there. I'm going to get them all on the podcast. We're going to do this. It's going to be awesome. Um, OMG. So, OMG. All right, Super you guys. <laughs> we'll talk to you later. All right. Hey, Kevin, for some reason, there's two of you in the.